Welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon. We are here to hold this conversation, panel discussion, science and climate action, how to address health impacts. Here we have to today Anna Stewart-Ibarra, an ecologist. She's executive director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Also Barbara Tapia Cortez, a meteorologist who, who is a technical coordinator of services at the regional office of the World Meteorological Organization for the Americas. And also Gabriel Sanchez Rivera, he specializes in sustainable development and he is a member of the Geography Institution of the uh, uh, Autonomous University of Mexico. The panel will be moderated by Michele Cantasaro, a physicist and a specialized journalist, a journalist specialized in science and the environment and an associate professor of uh, scientific journalism in the, at the University of Barcelona. He collaborates with publications such as Nature and Science. Thank you everyone for being here today. Miguel, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion. When I got the invitation and when I saw the report on the intersection between climate change and health that brings us here today and we, which we which we will address today i thought that it was a very interesting topic for several reasons first of all just because it's interesting clearly it's uh, scientifically relevant and practically re relevant as well given the nexus between climate uh, change and health. And this has to do with adaptation, with what we will do and how we're going to survive in this world with a modified climate. Uh, regarding our, or our health, and this is interesting in particular for my specialty, science communication, because as you might know, and for many years, climate change has been touted as this um, problem that has to do with the polar bear hanging from the tip of an iceberg, something that happens far away that affects the environment, which is different from us or from humankind. And actually we know that that's not true at all. Uh, we are part of the environment and climate change affects every area in our lives. But it, it remains, th this perception, perception remains actually, and it affects climate action. The intersection be between climate change and health, I think is an opportunity from a communication perspective so that personally, individually, and urgently, we can actually see how we need to address this problem now, basically, because it's going to, affect us in one of the, uh, the most important aspects of our lives, which is our health. So without further ado, I would like to start this conversation with our speakers today. So we will be diagnosing this situation. We will be talking about what we know about the impact of climate change and health, and then we will try to map the actions and strategies that we have to face this challenge. There will also be some time, we will agree on this time, according to the total time we have in order to address your questions. So I suggest that if you have important questions, there's a lot of people here today. So please really let us focus on important topics or, or things that haven't been addressed in the conversation. And Latino America 21 will be um, filtering the comments and then we will devote some time to address two or three of these questions. So first things first, which are these impacts of climate change on health? So what I wanted to ask the panel, and you can take the floor as you wish and we can have a conversation. But basically the question is, is this a future thing? Is this a risk? Can we then have an, uh, an impact on health caused by climate change? Or are we going through this? And if this is the case, how is this happening? 
So whoever wants to go first, please go ahead. Thank you, Michele. I would like to talk about specific data and, and how climate change is affecting health and us, and it has uh, for a long time, but we have been blind regarding the impacts or results. Uh, there are two reports by the WMO on this climate change focused on health launched at last year's COP in Abu Dhabi about health in November of 2023. And also the state of the climate report for Latin America and the Caribbean regarding 2023, which was launched uh, in May, at the beginning of May. Both reports talk about increased temperatures globally and regionally. 2023 has been the hottest year uh, recorded. 2024 is not over yet, so we don't know what will happen, but 2023 was mainly warm, especially because of El Nino that affected us since April and until one month ago. And now we are changing uh, or migrating to La Nina. Regarding global and regional warming, extreme heat and heat waves have increased. And these are more increasingly persistent events and affect elderly people. Older adults uh, might have some problems in this case with the new generations. And also between uh, 2019 and 2020, annually in Latin America and the Caribbean, there have been 36,000 deaths related to the impact of high temperatures. At the same time, droughts are also related, severe droughts are related to heat waves and also with wild uh, fires. And this tends to increase a, a poor quality of air and also this leads to health issues and cardiovascular issues. These reports state that until 2020, there had been premature in, uh, deaths associated with suspended uh, particle matter, 2.5 in its density. And this is now worse given the uh, for wildfires and ozone levels. And there are many other events that have to do also, for instance, with precipitation levels and how uh, related to droughts and how this has affected the uh, location of vector-borne diseases that are taking place. For instance, we have now dengue cases in areas that did not have dengue before, for instance, Chile and also Uruguay for chikungunya. So these are very specific cases that show us that actually climate change affects health directly. Thank you. Uh, Anna, do you agree with this? So this is not an abstract problem. It's something that has happened and has been happening. Yes, thank you. To follow up on what Barbara has said, climate change is actually something that is already happening. It's not a future event. It's a here and now issue. As Barbara said, the El Nino event increased temperatures and started in 2023 and persisted in 2024. In 2023, a record was broken in the Americas with over 4.5 million cases of dengue. And in 2024 to this date, we have had over 5 million cases. And I'm sure that these figures are underestimating reality because there is underreporting in dengue given the clinical characteristics of the disease. If you're not familiarized with dengue, it is highly sensitive to climate conditions given the biology and ecology of the vector that spreads the disease that requires accumulated water for reproduction. If temperature increases, the transmission cycles increase, reproduction cycles as well, and also the, the stinging rates appear up to a certain threshold. As Barbara has said, we have seen an increase in the geographic distribution of the vector. So the mosquito is now 
it now appears in other areas, new areas where it hadn't been there before. Therefore, the transmission area is now increasing for diseases like dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Uh, this year, we had a huge outbreak, uh, a big outbreak in Uruguay in the southern cone of South America. Also, the virus has been spread in the south of Europe and in the south of the United States. So it's a reality that climate sensitive diseases are spreading and they are a huge threat to public system, uh, public health systems. Those are uh, terrible numbers. Uh, so you have co-authored uh, Gabriel, a uh, chapter on the report that focuses on, on one of these aspects, and we will develop each one. But in a way, this is a, the clearest aspect, uh, heat. Actually, we will and are now living through um, a very uh, anomalous temperatures in, for instance, in India, India very recently, and every year we get cases that are uh, out of normal uh, rates. So what do you know about um, the specific impact of health on, of heat on health? Gabriel, please uh, unmute your mic. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I completely agree with what our colleagues have said, both Barbara and Anna. Um, this has to do with climate, of course, but only part of the population who specializes in this can really uh, assess what's happening. On the contrary, the population has a different perception. And there is this perception uh, that is changing because now the population is beginning to feel these changes, especially when it comes to heat. And this has to do with increasing temperatures, of course, but also with the context design and urban development. Uh, these are the urban determinants, determinants that the population is familiarized with. So there's a, a direct impact on health and also a financial impact on governments in uh, communities and societies. The impact on health can be seen from basic effects, for instance, headaches, being irritable, uh, having some personal issues as well. And that increases the number of cases that have, have to do with heat stroke. So that's a major issue uh, that needs to be addressed, not just analyzing the climate side of uh, things uh, globally, but also the local issues and each community is different uh, because maybe the the right mitigation measures haven't been implemented because the, there wasn't this per perception people thought that this was a, a problem in the north pole far away from me okay yes uh i think you're saying that you're focusing on a specific um environment which is the city uh and it's how, and in cities, the impact of heat is particularly difficult. Uh, why are you focusing on, on the urban landscape? This is felt everywhere, but in cities in particular, this has to do with the uh, changes in land use because there's lack of trees uh, as opposed to other areas or rural areas because there, is, there might be more wind or open areas, there's shade, but it's not the, that's not the case in the cities because we have infrastructure, concrete. Um, these actually trap heat and during the night, then the heat comes out so there's, of course, radiation emissions, different gases because of the vehicles used, et cetera. So the feeling inside cities is, is uh, harder because we lack infrastructure to provide um, a co a cooling relief for the population. And also 
many times people focus on older people and children because clearly they are much more vulnerable, of course, given their physical characteristics. But we are forgetting the people in the middle, the workers that they, um, the workers that need to leave home, uh, travel to their job, etc. And in that. Um, uh, transport, they lack the necessary places to cool down, to stop for the bus, uh, to wait for the bus, they don't like, the, they don't have the necessary shade, they have no infrastructure for drinking water, etc. So there's an economic issue as well, because we're affecting labor, we're affecting these uh, employees that work in cities. Yes, there is this island heat effect you're talking about, this phenomenon you're describing. Please correct me if I'm wrong. This uh, like additional um, accumulation because it's now hotter and even hotter in cities because of this phenomenon. Maybe Anna wanted to say something about this because we'll be discussing this. Thank you. It's just a quick comment. I completely agree with Gabriel. Also, I would like to talk about the impact of heat on rural populations, in particular in agricultural areas. Uh, studies show, especially in Central America, the huge impact of kidney, chronic, chronic kidney disease and also occupational health issues, uh, especially people working outdoors, agriculture, uh, construction, they're exposed to high and increasing temperatures. And there is this urgent need to legislate to protect the health of these workers. Thank you, that's very interesting and very important. The, no environment is safe now. Um, when we focus on a, an environment, for instance, in the city, we have the island, the heat island phenomenon, but in this other case, of course, outdoor workers, and they are also affected. I agree with Anna, of course. It has to do with the, what I was saying. We are forgetting about workers. Is that sector of the population who is economically active? and they are much, let's say, stronger, apparently they have better health, but they're more vulnerable because they're more, ex more exposed. Also, we should remember uh, these people as well. Thank you. Barbara, maybe you would like to say something about this. If not, then our mapping is complete regarding the several, the different impacts, besides the, the, the most obvious impact, which is heat which are the other areas that are being affected by climate change regarding health. We've talked about many, we've talked about vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases, food security, maybe you can add uh, something else to this list. Yes, it's all that, and to complement what Gabriel was saying, there are some things that we're not paying attention to, or not in every country. For instance, UV radiation values. Um, on the equator, where they have 12 hours of sunlight, and people start working very early, and people are exposed to heat stroke, uh, to sunstroke, and no precautions are taken. Gabriel is right. We're not considering that age group, the ones that work. And um, the, the, this has to do with the uh, socioeconomic evolution of each country. Um, so I think that this also affects how people eat. I'm not an expert in this, but still, we need to remember that extreme events focus not just on high temperatures. There's also, for instance, the increase in the number of tropical storms or precipitation level, um, unrelated floodings, etc. So we need to start uh, um, uh, having a more comprehensive perspective and focusing mainly on people and in particular, early warning systems. Every country should do its best to protect its population. 
Thank you. Anna was writing something in the chat, quite an interesting uh, map. Uh, maybe we can talk about these impacts. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. I think that Barbara has already said this, um, um, but just to mention other impacts, uh, quality affecting respiratory health, also how people eat, mental health, the impact on mental health regarding families, for instance, people affected by external features, um, displaced people, uh, losses and injuries, deaths because of extreme events, also mental health re regarding the loss of natural environments, uh, social, spiritual and cultural connections, the loss of glaciers, mountains, uh, water bodies. There's so many things that we're just now beginning to consider. In the latest, I, latest IPCC report, they analyzed Latin America and there was no evidence about uh, the impact on mental health. So I think it's a huge, huge area for us to start um, developing uh, policies and, and producing evidence. Gabriel. I agree with Anna. One of the most important things regarding health is climate issues, of course, extreme events. Uh, but there's something else that is related, and this has to do with inequalities. Um, you know, access or uh, lack of access to decent living conditions. And this is very important and it's not very being considered. In Mexico and other Latin American countries, uh, you know, uh, irregular housing units have been built and that is terrible. For instance, in the peninsula of Yucatan, we have that from the very beginning in their planning, they haven't considered the inclusion of green areas. They have actually cut everything down and they add a one or because it's cheaper and they add a few trees and that increases uh, the vulnerability of these populations. Because in the peninsula, for instance, these developers, the ones that have money and that organize the housing unit construction, they come from the center of the country. They live in different conditions, geographically speaking. They come fr fr from a volcanic area to a low uh, forest area. And they're building houses with low ceilings, duplex houses, and this causes uh, crowding. So there's a number of uh, social conflicts as well, which are terrible and that affect health, but also the social fabric. There's intra-family violence. People are, are are upset. They cannot stay at home because it's too hot and they try to live outside and there's car horns and they fight with the neighbors. It's a huge problem. And it has to do with this connection with increased temperatures and this feeling people have. You've mentioned a key word, Gabriel, and this is my next question. Uh, the journalists uh, that have covered climate change for a long time, now we can see that talking about impact, uh, impacts generally makes no sense. For instance, we can focus on, environment, on the environments but also that inequality is essential as a factor because impacts are different depending on each person's position within the social environment. So I wanted to ask you specifically about this, climate change and health. What's the role of inequality in these impacts that you have described? And also regarding the role of uh, social differences, opportunities, vulnerability of the uh, varying collectives. Okay, first of all, we can say that it's essential. It's one of the key points we should address. When we conduct an analysis in any city, this is very clear how things are organized in the society 
uh, lower class, mid class, higher class. And this has to do with the trees and the vegetation, the percentage of vegetation. When you come out into the street, you have a look at the number of trees and you can tell which the socioeconomic status of the, the area is. So it's essential. And also, of course, crowding, because the fewer trees, the more people live there. Can I say something? Yes, please feel free to participate as you wish. Don't worry. Thank you. Uh, so regarding what Gabriel is saying, I would like to add that uh, uh, vulnerability and poverty intersect. Mm, someone might be poor and also a woman or of African descent. So all the different inequality access intersect and determine a person's vulnerability and that varies a lot. We need to understand that climate change has to do with uh, gender, has to do with inequality, generational inequality. It has to do with children, social classes, income, and ethnic groups as well. So these axes intersect and determine uh, the vulnerability of a population. And that's also included in the latest IPCC report. All of us experience the impacts of climate change change, but not in the same way as women, children, older people, indigenous peoples, local communities that depend on their environment and other groups, they are the ones that, that are impacted the most. Uh, at the Yucatan Peninsula, for instance, and given the uh, tourism, they depend on tourism for their economy. So the, there's lots of migrants, who are not from the region, they are not adapted, they come from a different climate or area, so they are even more vulnerable. And also there's gender differences, uh, and they're much uh, more marked that, than in other areas. It's clearly women that work the most or, or are affected the most. Michelle Marmot, an author, said that in order to uh, find out the, what the health is in a population, it, you have more information if you know what their postcode is and not the, the DNA makeup. So, okay, workers are exposed uh, in, in the means, uh, on the means of transport, and that's usually uh, males. But women stay at home in these uh, homes that are not uh, adapted for the uh, region, adapted to the region's climate or an extreme events, of course. It's not just temperatures, it's hurricanes. In Mexico, we're very much, very much used to measuring cy uh, cy uh, cyclones or hurricanes, according to the Phil Simpson scale. But that doesn't work uh, so much for us. We need to measure the impact of rainfall as well. We have had huge disasters associated with tropical storms given the rainfall uh, or precipitation levels. That's truly interesting as an example regarding how we can implement cross-cutting actions in different regions in the world or social uh, groups uh, at a regional level, because this can be problematic. Even if it's an objective measure, a scientific measure, they, maybe it cannot be used in a given place. In 2020, we had four cyclones. We had one of them was a tropical storm and three hurricanes. We had the Cristobal tropical storm, which had more water than the other three events together. So it was more impactful as well. Okay. So we have said many things then that are quite harsh, huge figures, worrying impacts. So it's a huge mess. But if we have understand something about climate change, we shouldn't just describe the situation. It is essential as well to answer the question, now what? What are we going to do now? I think that the community, the scientific community now focuses a lot more on finding solutions, on um, being committed to the actions of uh, proposing 
that uh, proposing a range of options so that society can choose democratically and implement as well. So that at least we can adapt uh, to the negative impact that we will go through because of uh, climate change. So in the second part of our panel, I would like to focus on this aspect. Let me throw in an open question so that the three panelists can answer them. Which actions do you think are the most important ones when it comes to uh, limit the impact of climate change on health? Maybe each of you can share with me one or two actions that you find are the most relevant. Barbara, would you like to go first? Yes, as I was saying before, and for instance, the UN is focuses on the early warning systems for everyone. But this is a huge uh, endeavor. How can we ground it? How do we get the information to the population? These are early warning systems uh, created to focus on people so that they have more information. And uh, by 2027, we expect everyone to be protected or to receive early warning information so that they can make informed decisions. And the huge challenge is for that information to reach everyone. Nowadays, most people use a mobile phone, but uh, with different languages and many times the, uh, the warning systems are just written in Spanish. In Guatemala, they have 23 different languages. So it's important to reach those people as well. And also regarding what was said before about women and children that have different perspectives when it comes to um, assessing an extreme event. Uh, women uh, stay at home and look after children and older adults um, might not have the resources to leave their house. But the idea is to have these early warning systems to work together to empower people and to work with different institutions or stakeholders so that we can have a more uh, efficient monitoring, uh, threat monitoring. Each country has a different threat. Uh, Gabriel was talking about tropical storms in the Caribbean, for instance, but they do not affect the southern cone of the continent in the same way. So each country needs to decide which are the threats um, affecting them. They need to monitor them and work regarding forecasting and early warning systems. We need to have, they need to have good communication and need to support communities if they are impacted. Um, but it's clear that we will have to face extreme systems um, every day. We will have more hurricanes, yes, but if we are ready, if we're prepared, we can prevent some um, conditions. We're not going to prevent damage to um, um, assets, but we can save lives. So as countries, we need to work together to have better results. It has been proven that every country that has an early warning system, these countries um, recover that money because they don't have to invest money to save lives or to cover losses. So it was basically that. We also need to focus on the people um, that are most vulnerable, women, rural population, indigenous populations, because these early warning systems need to focus on people and we need to have one system and reach the communities. But it's not a UN activity, an institution activity. Each country needs to appropriate these systems because it's countries themselves that know their weaknesses and how to uh, progress in this regard. Thank you. I have a question that might be a bit naive, but I'm trying to 
uh, pretend I am um, part of the public as well. For instance, early warning system, there's a tsunami, people are on the beach and they, how would this work in detail? What are we talking about exactly? Which phenomena, for instance, can be part of this early warning system? And second, what are we talking about? Would this be a, a mobile notification? Would this include other media and include people? Can you tell us a bit more about what we talk about when we're talking about an early warning system? Yes, it's all that, but it, it depends on the country. I'm from Chile, we're used to earthquakes and tsunamis. So the population needs to deal with different things, but this depends on each country. Uh, depending on the threats the country faces. But usually the disaster risk reduction at the UN classifies uh, different classes and the ones we know the most are hydrometeorological, um, heat, droughts, uh, floods, etc. But there are also biological, chemical, geological threats. There's so many. But what's important is for each country to be ready to issue this type of warning because warnings are not just independent. They can be independent, they can be simultaneous and they, they can uh, cascade. During the pandemic, for instance, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, there was a uh, volcanic eruption. So should I uh, evacuate people, for instance? But it was a pandemic, so we couldn't be, we couldn't have people gathered. Um, so how do you do this? There are two threats. There were two threats in this case. Of course, each country needs to decide which are the most harmful threats. And people also need to learn and understand and receive these warnings from uh, renowned institutions, because there's also the issue of fake news, you know, social media disseminate uh, these news. Uh, and that's an issue. People need to start thinking about who is issuing the warning. And also they need to, use uh, their mobiles, text messages, because all of this helps. But of course, we should remember other alarms in the case of a tsunami, for instance. It's like combining everything. It's, it's very difficult to say, OK, this is the only threat that affects me. And there's also biological threats, as I was saying, because in the past, we never thought that COVID something like COVID would happen, and it did. Anna, I would like to add something and share some specific health-related examples. Nowadays in the region, they're working with early warning systems for the public health sector regarding heat waves in Buenos Aires, for instance, or also for dengue air epidemics in Brazil. These are models that include epidemiological information. So this is disease uh, cases through the monitoring and surveillance systems in the country regarding uh, uh, epidemics. This is combined with uh, forecasting, climate observations, precipitation, temperature. For instance, there is low risk, high risk or, or mid risk of something happening. It's like the traffic light system. Um, yellow, green, or red. And actually the public health sector needs to decide and develop all these models. First, conduct an analysis and then knowing which are the, the subsequent actions. Many times it's not just about warnings. These, there are, early, uh, there are also early action plans that are triggered when the warning is issued. For instance, this involves mobilizing people, resources, communication plans, everything that Barbara said, everything that is triggered uh, automatically because there was this joint work done by the sectors. And this is essential for an early warning system to work. 
Okay, so early warnings, great. Any other actions that you would highlight? I know that the list is almost endless, but it's to give people an idea about all this and to encourage them to read that re report. We have the, the link in the chat so that they have some inspiration and they have an agenda. I would say that it's an, a, a political agenda as well regarding what can be done. Gabriel. Yes, uh, I agree. Just one idea regarding disasters. The disasters are not natural. It's something we need to state clearly. The disaster is social. It is the society that becomes vulnerable and that is at risk um, and can be affected by the phenomena. An early warning system will not be efficient if, if there is no uh, support, and in this case, it's resources. In the case of Quintana Roo, for instance, for hurricanes, we are fully prepared after what happened in Gilbertra in the 80s, also Vilma, uh, the cyclone or the most intense hurricane in the Atlantic. We have learned a lot from these experiences. When we get the early warning that there might be a cyclone, everything starts going, you know, the system, the process is triggered. In the case of heat waves, it's useless to know that we will have a 10-day a heat wave if we lack the infrastructure to deal with it. Okay, I can buy some bottled water, but I need the necessary trees. I need uh, transport with um, AC, etc. So it's a number of things. It's not just one thing as a solution. And of course, governments need to make the, de the decisions. We need to give decision makers the necessary elements so they can start building this infrastructure and do something about this event when the early warning system works. Uh, yes, so we need a specific uh, uh, solutions, but also uh, permanent solutions, yes. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this topic. We have talked about land use, urban vegetation, etc. And that seems to be a key aspect. For instance, nowadays in Barcelona, this is a, a, a bit of a problem, how we use this urban space. Traditionally, for instance, um, the use of vehicles, etc. But we need to be resilient to deal with this uh, changing climate. So can you tell us a bit more about this, this green infrastructure you mentioned as a solution that has a positive impact on health? Yes. Different types of solutions. First of all, avenues. We can have local vegetation, trees that provide shade, not just pretty trees. Uh, what we need is shade. That first of all. Second, we should recover some spaces and build parks garden in the right places. In Playa del Carmen, there's uh, an area where they have a main avenue with three parks, with different uh, sports courts. But you are, are right uh, next to a road where you have lots of lorries and buses that, you know, emit lots of gases. And it's even worse to have people playing a sport there in that area. So this design needs to be logical uh, and at different scales. For instance, people can grow trees in their backyards because it's like, oh, I need to mow uh, the lawn. I don't want to do it. So what happens with that? I, 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 do, I build some concrete flooring. Uh, for instance, uh, two weeks ago in the city of Mexico, we measured the temperature in the air 24 degrees. On the ground, it was almost 60 degrees. The difference was 30 degrees and in 1.70 meters. And of course, on the ground, you have the children playing, uh, your pets that go you take to the park. We can't really feel it as adults because we have shoes on. But what happens with the others? And we need to consider all this. 
this summer in one of these reformed areas in mass cities to have you know a greener area um uh a colleague actually assessed that difference, the difference in temperature in these green areas and in other areas where cars go by. And yes, it was like tens of degrees of a difference. It was it was shocking. Anna, thank you. Uh, regarding co-benefits, the co-benefits of mitigating climate change, for instance, planting trees means that CO2 can be captured from the atmosphere and it also um, has health benefits. We need to redesign cities so that we have cycling lanes and transport, uh, public transport lanes because there is a reduction in greenhouse gases and it also has health benefits. This is what we mean by co-benefits. We might not have all the measurements now, but we need to take action now. We cannot wait 10 more years to have a perfect model. Decision makers need to know what to do now. So these actions are very specific and can uh, be very beneficial for the population. Yes, for instance, ecosystem services, and this is what Anna is saying. And this has been documented, of course, but we need to disseminate it. The population should know that trees are valuable just because they're giving you shade. They're also important because they fulfill a number of functions as a system. These are known uh, as ecosystem services because they have studied these, their benefits. I remember that in the Climate, Health and Environment Report in Latin America, for Latin America and the Caribbean, these topics are developed. For instance, something interesting regarding climate policy co-benefits, the co-benefits of uh, policies on climate change and on obesity. This intersection is fascinating, or also regarding early warning systems, and some chapters deal with this. If you want more information, you can, of course, read this report because it's quite clear and accessible. Also, please remember that there is the uh, Zoom uh, area for you to ask questions. So now is the time to do this because we are close to the end of the meeting. So if you have any questions, comments or anything, please go ahead. Now you, you can send us your question. So we are now moving towards the more operational and even political uh, aspects. What should we actually do to address all this? Uh, let's, let's imagine your advisors or, uh, or your advice policymakers at a given municipality, country, region, or globally even, you can choose your level which you, would be your main suggestions if you could uh, talk to your next president or the next mayor in, in your city, if you could tell them what you think is the most urgent action or what should be included in the elections plan, what would you tell them? I would say that it's essential for them to develop the national adaptation plan for the health sector. It's HNAPs in English, health national adaptation plans, because if they don't have that, it's very difficult to mobilize international green climate change funds that are needed to then implement all the actions that we have addressed. Very interesting. Okay, we, have a, we should have a checklist uh, and we should ask politicians to include this in their elections plans. Um, in the Mexican Caribbean, and uh, it, everything is very mystic. Usually, we should tell mayors that cities should be built for people to live in, and because many people, many areas are considered supporting uh, areas. 
uh, like workers are sent to these horrible housing units in uh, terrible conditions and they're not designed as cities they are not built as cities for people to enjoy these are just supporting areas and this entails including basic infrastructure shade areas drinking areas trees so that we can help people in every sense and not just for heat and for other events all the events people are exposed to as barbara said at the beginning so they need to learn about the city its context and its indications vulnerability and risks so you're really talking about urban policies equality policies design city design policies okay great barbara uh, if I had to write to Santa Claus, I would say that we need to pay attention to climate change because things are not going to change. Uh, our Earth is warming up and we need to adapt and coexist with this. As Gabriel said, we need to be able to live in cities. We're not visiting cities. So we need to find a way to help everyone not just a part of the city that, that needs to live well we all have the right to do this and early warnings are not a luxury it, it's a right everyone should have the minimum conditions to live better that's what i wanted to say great there's a question in the chat addressed to anna i've heard about an app to estimate uh uh, dengue development developed by the IAI. How can I have access to this app and evaluate its implementation if uh, in our country? Uh, we need a bit more information to, to talk about that, but I can confirm that we're working with the Caribbean, with the Caribbean Public Health Authority, and with some countries, including Barbados, St. Lucia, and Grenadas, to develop dengue forecasting models for the uh, countries. This, this is forecast-based modeling. That's our specific strategy. And this is being done with the national stakeholders in these countries in order to create the, the ideal platforms to implement this model. And very soon we will have more information. If you're looking for tools, I suggest that you go over a report published uh, by us and the Wellcome Trust last year. We analyzed every tool globally to model uh, climate sensitive diseases. These are free access tools. We analyzed the tools, we classified them. It's apparent, uh, approximately 30. Irene, can you please paste the link in the chat? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Irene. Okay, we have several questions. Uh, please be brief in your answers. Of course, you can answer the question you feel most comfortable with. How much do we know about the impact of uh, climate change on the health of indigenous peoples? Who would like to go? I think there is very uh, limited specific evidence. I think, as was said in the latest uh, IPCC report, they now have, there is now greater impact for them and they're more vulnerable in the future as well. I'm not an expert in the topic, but the, there are very few studies that actually show us more information. Gabriel might have more information. I agree, There's, there are very few studies on these vulnerable populations. What has been done in the last few years, in my case, is uh, uh, focusing on climate change adaptation actions by considering the environment. Some forestry issues, some coastal population issues as well, but conservation, uh, but regarding the conservation adaptation of the means of production, not, not regarding the population. We still need to focus on all this. For instance, uh, I think that the sociology section of the university and human geography sections or departments are focusing 
on this type of topic as well. Very briefly, I would like to say that it's important to identify which communities or we need to understand that local communities and indigenous peoples are not passive stakeholders. They're actually doing things. They have their own uh, solutions, ad um, adaptation measures. Um, now their wisdom is essential. And now we acknowledge the importance of working together by uh, combining Western science and indigenous knowledge when it comes to adapting to climate change. There's a question about the specific impacts on Latin America. Um, which diseases are mostly affected by climate change, in particular in Latin America? We have mentioned several, but is there uh, are these impacts specific in Latin America in any case? In the case of temperatures, there are more cases of heat stroke, first of all. Uh, and, and also, the number of cases increases every year, uh, especially regarding the our statistics. Nowadays, records are more accurate. So now we see that the effects that are, have to do with heat have increased. On rereading the question, I can see that they talked about mental health in particular. Are there specific uh, mental health impacts in Latin America? I think Anna talked about mental health at the beginning. Maybe you want to say something about this. Re, uh, uh, regarding its regional relevance. I won't answer about mental health in particular because it's not my area of expertise, but I'm pasting the Lancet countdown in the chat. This is a Latin American uh, chapter. And regionally, they, they are trying to create country indicators of the impacts of climate change on different health areas. There's something like 30 to 40 indicators. This is a global initiative that is now being adapted and scaled for the region. In the chat, you can see much more specific um, indicators regarding the impacts of climate change and health. You have specific areas. Another question. If we had to talk about uh, or an impl the implementation of an SAT, should we do this regionally, globally, uh, nationally, or for a specific purpose? An early warning system. This kind of system needs to be implemented nationwide because they have all the country resources and it is the country that has the resources to address a specific area regarding support and recovery if there is an extreme event. We need to work nationwide. We need to learn about risk management. As I said before, countries need to face different threats. But what helps us is being able to um, disseminate these warnings through uh, warning, uh, common warning protocols, but also, of course, hurricanes affect more than one country or region. So systems need to be interconnected because some countries have better monitoring uh, resources and they can help uh, a neighbor country. But we, got, we should also start from the national level in order to make progress and advance national early warning systems. Okay, the final question that I think is quite interesting regarding uh, climate change uh, causing different zoonoses. We know there is a relationship, there is an effect. Do we? Please go ahead. Do you know about this? Well, that's not my area of expertise, actually. Okay. Well, then 
we can have one more question for your final uh, comment. It's a universal question and quite shocking. According to what you have said, and despite everything that we can do to change this situation, can we say that we cannot control the law, the social losses and infrastructure losses? So this is a huge mess, and we will we will not get out of it easily. So this is like the final uh, comment, so that you can say something about it, Barbara. Well, yes, extreme events will keep occurring and affecting us. We need to be ready. We need to work together and monitor this event, these events so that we can face them. This doesn't mean that we will be able to prevent them, but we need to work to do something. But every day shocks us even more because extreme events are becoming stronger and more usual. So every year gets to be the hottest year and it's always one more year. And it, it will never get a quiet year. We just need to be ready. Thank you. Gabriel. Yes, this seems to be the most temperate winter we've had because at this this is what will happen at this rate. I think that the solutions are difficult to reach, but what we need is will, the will uh, of uh, the, the organized societies, the authorities, the academic institutions, and also uh, it has to do with working together and identifying sp the specific problems of each group or city. And also implementing solutions, trying to find the necessary resources, the necessary funds. And also we need to get the help of different institutions and also the, the for instance, the tools provided by the IAI and different global institutions. Yes, we need to work together. There are some people that work great with communities others will participate from the from the science uh, side of things from the academia i do not believe in a catastrophe outlook but it's clear that things are not will not be easy but we have everything we need to um to survive i am optimistic i have been working in this area since 2007 and I have seen a radical change in the last year regarding political interest, the interest of people as well, and the number of actions and movements taking place now in this climate and health nexus. This requires strong collaboration as said between different stakeholders that haven't traditionally worked together and this requires a new health uh, and biomedical paradigm and we need to focus on human beings as an integral part of our systems. We are part of nature. This is health from a planetary health perspective. We are not alone. We are not isolated. And if we do this, we will be able to heal this harmful system that is now in the state it's in. Thank you, Gabriel Sanchez Rivera, Ana Stuart Ibarra, and Barbara Tapia Cortez. And also thank you, Irene Torres from the Inter American Institute for Global Change Research. And thank you, Angela Atanasio from Latin America 21 for organizing this uh, so intellectually interesting talk. Hopefully, now you have new knowledge, ideas for action, and hope. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.